for everyone in the audience, if you have any trouble hearing us at any point in time, maybe just raise a hand and we'll make sure that we get the mic fixed. Um, so for our panelists, thank you so much for uh, coming and visiting with us this evening. We're going to be having a conversation about water um, and, and what it means uh, to each of you in the work that you do uh, for water protection, um, and especially for uh, Haudenosaunee uh, communities uh, across uh, sort of the, what may be now known as a, a border, uh, our official border, because the water doesn't recognize it, right? We know that much. So if each of you could uh, introduce yourselves, uh, that would be really uh, amazing for our audience. So maybe we'll start with you. Okay. Uh, my name is Caleb Abrams. I'm an enrolled member of the Seneca Nation, uh, Wolf Clan. I'm originally from Ohio, the Allegheny Territory. Uh, but I now live in Buffalo and I work for the uh, Seneca Nation's uh, Seneca Media and Communications Center on the Cattaraugus Territory. I'm also the associate producer of the uh, documentary we just watched, Lake of the Trail. Uh, no, I scan also way up. I'm Jason Corwin. I'm the director of Seneca Media and Communications Center. And um, my family's from Cataraugus, but I've been living in um, Ohio for the last three years. Scanos uh, Sobuego. My name is uh, Beverly Jacobs. I'm from uh, Mohawk Bear Clan and live here at Six Nations. I'm a lawyer, a uh, law professor at the University of Windsor. And I just finished um, my doctorate, which is looking at the impacts of uh, holistic health as a result of resource development and recognition of uh, Haudenosaunee laws protecting our holistic health, which includes everything. Um, yeah. uh, my name is Paul. I am the director of the film Lake Betrayal. Uh, I've been producing films for close to 25 years now, and uh, this one premiered nationwide on PBS back in October of last year. And my name is Scott Scott Sackett. I worked with Paul and with Caleb on this film as well. Um, I think uh, I'll just add uh, I'm a lifelong Western New Yorker, um, and I've been visiting the Alleghenies my entire life, and it surprised me um, that I didn't learn about the story until late in life, and I certainly knew nothing about termination. Um, and so one of the things that Paul and I have done for many years in many films, uh, working on historical documentaries, it's very rewarding work, um, and we do a lot of work for PBS, and so sharing the story uh, was meaningful. Thank you, everyone. And for those that may just be joining us, um, my name is Kelsey Leonard. I'm going to serve as the moderator for this evening's panel discussion. I serve currently as an instructor of Six Nations Polytechnic and as a Phil Matthew Fellow in Water Policy at McMaster University and from Mission Accommodation. So I'm really excited to be here with you to have a conversation on, on water. And when we're thinking about water and your work, I'm curious as to how you find yourselves advocating for, for water protection and in each of your fields? Well, <laughs> I guess I'll start. <laughs> um, I, I, as, as, as a filmmaker, um, we don't necessarily walk into a project with an agenda. Um, that helps to keep our objectivity, but we do know right from wrong. And our, our intention is to, to create dialogue, just like what we're doing here. Um, because a film, a good film, really is not, isn't set, we don't set up to, to, um, to get answers necessarily. Our, our intention is to ask the questions, or to raise questions, allow the film to raise questions. And I think in, in, in some way that is, now, that becomes the advocacy because it creates the dialogue. And because nothing happens, nothing changes unless you have that dialogue. So for, for me as a filmmaker, uh, that's, that's the, the advocacy. I find a story that has meaning and, that need, and a story that needs to be shared. And, uh, and this was, was certainly one of them. When, 
we started this project, we were aware of what was happening with the North Dakota Access Pipeline. And that was one of the reasons that we were able to secure the funding to make the film. And I think that there's always a question among, and I will just say environmentalists, they'll say, well, why are you doing a story about history? Why don't you just do a story about what's happening today? Because this is really important. That happened a long time ago. Well, if you've seen the film, or if you're an ad, uh, if you like historical documentaries, it tells us a lot about what's going on today, and some of the mistakes that were made in the, in the past, and some of the, the, the right decisions that were made, in this case, all the right decisions that the Seneca Nation made. And so, uh, there's a lot of value, I think, in historical documentaries. That's one of the reasons we did this. So, it, it, has, it, has, a, it has relevance today. Okay, so there's a lot of connections of the work that I've been doing in relationship to um, missing and murdered indigenous women and the relationship to the land and the water and how it's all connected uh, when it comes to erasing um, indigenous people and who we are as a people is, is erasing the women first and um, and so that's still happening. Um, and so the connection to the water and, and the land and the women is all it's all connected. And so when I when I started the work, the my doctorate is with uh, the community of Akwazasne. And so a lot of what um, happened in Seneca territory is also uh, happening in Akwazasne with the development of the St. Lawrence Seaway and, and all of the work that they've done to protect their lands and territories and their water and the same impacts. And so part of this whole idea, this whole way of thinking of Haudenosaunee people is that connection to our land and our water and all of creation, it's all, it's all part of the same. And so what I'm, what I'm hoping to do and what I've been advocating for is the recognition of Haudenosaunee laws. And because there's been such an impact of who we are as a people through uh, genocidal colonial laws and their policies, um, is to educate um, not only um, non-Indigenous, but our own people, and to empower ourselves. Um, and it has to also be the empowerment of the women to take back our power and their relationship to the water. Um, and one of the messages that I got in, in my study um, was listening to the elders and the people who have been doing the work. And one of them was, um, is um, Gudji Cook. And uh, being a midwife and the relationship of, of giving birth and water and the role of women and her key message about um, women being the first em environment. And, um, and so there's, that's all the connections um, and how do we how do we empower that uh, relationship of um, not only of the women but all of all the people and understanding uh, our ways of being um, and how all of that is all related um, and empowering that. So my envir environmental interest, I guess you could say, started um, scary for me to say almost 30 years ago in high school um, when I became involved with um, people from the American Indian Movement. And I was doing a lot of work around the issue taking place with the Diné elders at Big Mountain. And they had this huge coal mine, um, the world's largest strip coal mine going on. And here they're in an area with um, limited water resources and this mine is 
using like tens of thousands of gallons to slurry the coal to the power plant. And um, there are other, you know, just different, every community anywhere, any native community is facing some kind of a water contamination issue practically. And in the 90s, when we were both, Kelsey and I, uh, living in Philadelphia, I became very influenced by um, a Black Panther journalist who was on death row named Mumia Abu-Jamal. Um, and, and he was a very um, open advocate for um, journalism as a means for social change. And I got involved in filmmaking, um, writing for newspapers, radio, and, and it sort of started a whole um, media and interest that's gone on obviously for a long time until now. Um, but the environmental interest was always there. And so as um, coming into the 2000s, I got very involved in renewable energy and green building and um, learning these technologies, learning how to install um, solar and micro hydro and um, make biodiesel and things like that. And it was just because of this awareness of th just the crazy amount of um, energy that we're using nowadays and the resource impacts that are taking place and then how that it's all connected, like she was saying, you know, to missing and murdering women because of the man camps that are in these places where um, fracking and tar sands development and all that's taking place. So, you know, I'm, I feel very fortunate to have the job that I have now where um, even though the Seneca Nation tasked me with developing media, um, not everybody knew um, within the nation that I had um, recently gotten a PhD in natural resources from Cornell um, and, and I was able to put, you know, kind of tout that title around when, when we had this fight over the, um, the fracking wastewater plant and say, you know, I'm not just the media guy, you know, I'm, I'm, I put a lot of time and energy and research into environmental issues. So it was, it's been cool to be able to do that um, in my professional work for the nation and then work with a, a tremendous group of other professionals from our conservation department, our environmental protection department, GIS, um, the health department in a watershed resources working group to, um, to address this issue and, and others that take place. Like we have um, blue-green algae in the reservoir now that's, that's really bad. So my father and my uncles, my grandparents, and a lot of my extended family were among the over 600 Senecas that were forcibly relocated um, due to the construction of the Kinzua Dam. So I grew up with this story my whole life. You know, I'm very familiar with it. Um, but I, you know, maybe kind of took that for granted, my familiarity. And it wasn't until I went away to school, to college, uh, in Jamestown, New York. It's about 15 miles west of the territory boundary. I was blown away at the uh, level of ignorance that I was encountering uh, from my non-native classmates, how little they knew and understood, which prompted me to produce a student documentary in 2010 uh, called Remembering the Removal. Um, it was a final project for a digital video editing course I was taking. I interviewed my dad, my grandmother, a number of other elders, um, and it, I just felt compelled to try and educate my dozen or so classmates who, who knew nothing about what I was talking about and yet lived so close by. Um, and it was through that project that I eventually met Paul and Scott and got involved with Lake of Betrayal uh, three years after that. Um, but I always kind of wondered, you know, what it was like to have been alive during that battle against Kinzua um, and how I might have participated, what it would have looked like for me to be a part of that effort to, to prevent the dam from being constructed. Uh, so when this wastewater treatment plant was being proposed earlier this year, uh, you know, I found myself uh, in a place, uh, it felt like history was repeating itself to a certain degree. And you know, I, my, my whole family would come out to these uh, Defend Ohio meetings. We'd all be there, my grandmother, my 
parents, brother, sister, everybody's would come out. And I, I just, I felt like I wanted to make sure that I did and partic did everything that I could and participated as much as I could in, in that effort to halt you know, this project, just like I wish or that I would have liked to had I been around during the Kinzua days. Um, and I, th I guess it's through that same sort of thinking that I, you know, I, I think a lot of us in indigenous communities may not label ourselves environmentalist outright because of the teachings that we grow up with uh, are inherently protective of the environment and our natural resources. Though you may not carry the title of environmentalist because it just seems to make sense. Of course, you would want to protect that. Um, and I, I hope that yeah, I'm able to do that through my work as well. So I, what you shared has really resonated with me. Um, my uh, family um, was very uh, integrated and, and integral in the um, preservation of and leadership of urban Indian centers in, in Pennsylvania and in both the city of Pittsburgh and the city of Philadelphia. And so growing up as a Native student in Pennsylvania, it's very common for non-Indigenous folks in that state to say, oh, there's no more Indians here. Um, you know, we have no reservations, so they never existed. Um, they were all, they, you know, they died out at some point in, in history. Um, and it's very common in the United States, um, and um, I, I think you know also also here in, in Canada to have this uh, narrative of history that limits Indian removal to a period of the 1800s, when in reality it's it's ongoing. Colonization is ongoing. Water colonialism is is ongoing. And for me, as a as a young Native person in Pennsylvania, Kinzua was that was that story of uh, of contemporary Indian removal and resistance. Um, and so, I, I my question for you is. Why is that story uh, still relevant? Why is Kinzua um, not just a story that every Pennsylvanian should know, but every American and every global citizen should know when we think about planning for a future of shared sustainability? I'll start again. Well, I, um, in the sense that that's an, that's an ongoing, what happened at Kinzua, is an ongoing, and it was even before, way before that. Um, the erasure of our people, the, the genocidal policies that um, both governments, the Canadian and the American governments, have, have done to try to erase us as a people. And I say try, because um, they have not been successful. And we have consistently had to fight um, to fight for our rights to the land and our and the territories. Um, but it's also the resiliency of our people because our people have always, like you, like Caleb said, has always been inherently environmentalists, <laughs> and that we have always remembered our relationship to the land and the water and the territory, and that those are our responsibilities. That's part of our laws um, and our relationship to all of creation. That's our responsibility to do that. And so what's happening right now in this place called Canada is this Prime Minister of Canada who wants to now put in this pipeline, the Kinder Morgan, um, through the, the Western territories, and it has an impact on, it will have an impact on all of us, just like Standing Rock. And so we all have that responsibility that we're, we're all gonna have to stand up at some point no matter where we're from, or where we're, and things are happening here in this territory that um, we need to stand up. We need to take back our, our responsibilities and say that's enough because, like we always have, it's been a very consistent um, responsibility that we've had and we've never given that up. 
And I think that's the important message also to the next generations um, to understand why. Um, because the big message has always been about money and jobs, right? And, um, and so that's where actually my dissertation comes into also is resource development and the whole reason why uh, is to, it, the whole purpose of it was to erase our, our people. We're still in the way of development. So, um, and it's about money. So, and, our, and there's always been historic messages that we can't eat money. And, you know, those are, those are the things that we need to understand and return back to our um, our, our own ways of being. Yeah, well, um, I, 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 I think the, the Kinswood Dam story is, is, is relevant today um, because, because this, as you say, the, these things are still going on. Um, it's just they take a different name, a different shape, a, happen in a different place. But it's the same, same things going on. And, 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 and also what, what, what makes it relevant, I believe, is the fact that we have to learn from these experiences and what came before. And I think as each generation goes by, each generation gets a little more detached from the history and the understanding. And perhaps a little bit of the understanding of, of what the relationship with nature, with the earth, with the land, with the water, gets a little further away as well. And so by, 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 by having films like Lake Lake of Betrayal and others, I think, it, I'm hoping anyway, that it gets to a, a younger generation and they can understand how parents, grandparents, the elders felt about what was going on, and they can reconnect to that again, because I think that's important. Um, and I think, and I, I was thinking back because of the earlier conversation, the earlier question, and one of the uh, one of the first films I worked on was it had to do with the Seneca Nation and uh, the land lease in Salamanca, and I had met a gentle, a gentleman, Bruce, uh, uh, Dwayne Bowen. Deuce Bowen and uh, the Kinswood Dam was a tiny piece of that other film. And the second film I did for PBS was called Fading in the Mist. And it was about the uh, historic exploitation of Niagara Falls and the natural environment. And we interviewed uh, Dwayne Bowen for that, for that film. And I, to this day, I remember him saying, you know, that, that nature has a way of reclaiming itself. And uh, he, he said, Niagara might be crying right now, but she'll have a way of reclaiming herself. Mother Earth will do that. And, and so I felt like, you know, coming full circle to the, to the, uh, to the Kinsua crisis. And hopefully, nature will begin to reclaim and that land will be returned the way it should be and the, the river flowing the way it should be because dams are not natural to our environment. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not. And, uh, and so, so, yeah, I mean, the relevancy of films like this, I think it's kind of got a broad base. I think that's, that's really important in, in the factor that we need more education. We need more outreach for the wider community, both in our own indigenous communities, but also non-indigenous folks, to understand these issues, to understand how energy consumption and water protection are, are linked um, intricately, how our social welfare, how valuing indigenous laws in concert with non-indigenous and Western laws is integral to this conversation and, and, and very needed. Um, so I, I think where that challenges us is to, how do we get that message out? How do we connect with the average resident of Pittsburgh who doesn't realize that their economic and livability index that they enjoy in 2018 is a result of Indian removal from the 1950s? How do we communicate that to a modern audience? And, and, and in doing so, not 
lose contemporary issues facing your communities. So what are some of those threats and how are you working to communicate those threats to your water? I'll start again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this, this kind of format I think is important in, in community, but also getting the message out to community also I think is important. Um, setting up community workshops to understand the history of colonization and how resource development is a part of that. And also um, and how do we teach our kids about our laws, about our ways of being in today's society and how that's important because of what I found was that in the study that in order to be healthy is our lands have to be healthy and our water has to be healthy and that in order to protect that holistic health is by practicing our laws. So making sure we have our ceremonies, making sure we have um, our language, making sure we have all of those things that are set in place as to who we are. That's what protects our holistic health, which includes our relationship to the land and water. That's the conclusion of my dissertation. And for us, it's really simple. But when you're educating into the those who have not been raised that way, or those who are non-Indigenous who have no idea. Um, that's part of the, the struggle is because racism is huge and the stereotypes and how law, Canadian, American, Eurocentric law has been used as a tool to not allow anyone to learn that real history and real knowledge so I've been kind of, kind of in different places and different spaces, and any time there's an opportunity to educate, I educate. So I just met my old Mohawk College teacher from 1984, um, and um, she's in her 70s now, and she says, I have, a, I have a group of old ladies that meet together, there's about a hundred of us, do you want to come and talk to them about the work you're doing? So those are sort of the kinds of things that I've sort of, you know, infiltrating into all these different spaces to educate people because they never have. And that's part of, part of the problem these days. But it's managing, and, and films like this, um, and being able to put this kind of um, format into the law school that I'm going to be teaching and, and presenting this kind of, of work um, in the education system itself to lawyers, potential lawyers, or judges, or members of parliament, right? So that's been my, my goal these days. Don't, 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 wouldn't you love to see textbooks change? <laughs> <laughs> I know, uh, there's so much needs to be changed. And just to kind of follow up on, on what you were saying, when Scott and I were first working on the film, we, you know, people are always asking, what are you working on now? And so we'd, well, I'm working on a film about Kinswood Dam and uh, the Seneca Nation. And they said, oh, I love Kinswood. I love that reservoir. It's great fishing. I love going boating. There was absolutely no recognition or understanding of what the story was. And we would get that all the time. And, and, I, and, I, and I think there is a general ignorance in society about native and indigenous cultures. And it's because it's not taught in schools. And it should be. Um, so so there's, a, there's a general ignorance in the, in the population as far as indigenous stories. And I was amazed when, I, when Scott and I found out that 
Pittsburgh, the PBS station in Pittsburgh has aired this film twice and pledged it. <laughs> and it, and it, and I mean, it, it really, the, the, uh, the, I guess the audience, the, the audience was there for, for two or three airings. So, I mean, for me, that's a, that's a great sign that the word is getting out there. It's been airing across the country now since October. And the more stations air it, the more calls we get for things like this. And you have this community, then you begin to get the, uh, some community involvement. And again, this is what be starts and creates the dialogue. I think we're at a very ripe and opportune moment for education um, around indigenous values and ways of knowing the environment, because like there's always been this fascination um, and longing for indigeneity among the non-native public. Like in the U.S., they have the Boy Scouts and they dress up and have their little phony powwows. And then you know the '80s, '90s saw the explosion of the New Age movement and and that level of cultural appropriation and and just willful ignorance of um, you know wanting to decontextualize and 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 take away from the communities these and cherry pick these you know um, practices and traditions and values and and ignore the real reality of um, native people are dealing with um, economically socially emotionally environmentally and so on um, but in recent years and and particularly with what took place at Standing Rock and the amount of worldwide attention that took place and the coming together of um, native and non-native people working together. Like that was one thing that it really impressed me seeing there at the camps was, you know, sure there was, there was a couple people that looked like they, you know, um, just left Burning Man or Coachella or something like that. <laughs> and they were there for, for um, the party or whatever. But um, th the vast majority of instances I saw was, um, non-native people taking a step back and and um, looking to native people for leadership for for wisdom for being um, educated about things and and then I think for for us we saw the fruits of that and and what happened um, in um, with Cowdersport and this proposed fracking wastewater plant is like there there was a small group of the residents there who were opposed to this and they had been they had been aware of it since August of last year. They were clamoring and going to meetings and, and trying to get their officials to listen and they were being brushed off. And, um, and, and they've been dealing with, Pennsylvanians have been dealing with this fracking coming now. Pennsylvania is the second largest producer of natural gas in the US. And um, they're, that area, Potter County, um, where, where the headwaters of not just the Allegheny River starts, but also the eastern branch of the Susquehanna River and the Genesee River. So it's a, it's a triple divide watershed. There's only four of those in North America where continental shelves come together and three major river systems um, are born from, from one area. And this area is one of the most rural in Pennsylvania is now seeing f the fracking boom coming there. Um, and, you know, they were just like, you know, so excited. I mean, you could see it in, in the video we just watched for, for the, you know, viewers on YouTube um, who, who um, might not have seen that, but there'll be a link, you know, to that video, which um, we haven't even posted yet. We just finished it yesterday, haven't even cleaned up the sound and everything, um, but we were wanted to have it ready to show here. Um, you know, they were really touched by us coming out there in, in, in significant numbers and really um, putting, putting a stop to this project. And, and they've been coming every single week um, during the whole course of that to our community center to um, meet and, and work with us together. Um, cause, and, and even after we, we won that particular battle, um, there's still other threats to the river. There, there's now a proposed um, conventional oil and gas wastewater treatment plant um, just a short ways off territory being um, proposed and that's fairly far along and so we're still working together on that and um, 
So I think it's, it's an opportune time for more education and, and like um, Bev was talking about, you know, just how deeply entrenched the racism is. It's like, at least I, maybe it's just the friends I have, but what I see on social media is there's so many conversations taking place about um, privilege and, um, you know, the historical benefits that white people have gained in, in these colonial countries of Canada and the US um, from, from the subjugation of um, black and brown bodies and the dispossession of lands of indigenous people um, and, and that this is continuing into the present um, through, through the um, policing of borders and whatnot that there, this is the conversations that are happening even in mainstream news so it's like it's, it's up to us that are even in education or whatever, or even, you know, what it, you don't have to do media. You could just talk to people at your workplace and, um, and, and, you know, share information and just add, like, um, Paul was talking about, you know, movies raise, uh, questions and opportunities for dialogue. And it's like, you know, you can point people to videos and say, Hey, you know, um, they're, they're spewing out some ignorance. You say, hey, check this video out. Because a lot of times seeing things visually, that's what I love about the power of media, can really move people. It can change their minds um, and, and dispel stereotypes. So, you know, show, if we all have smartphones, you know, show somebody a YouTube video and have a discussion about it. Can I jump in? Okay, yes, definitely. because, uh, and this is mostly personal regarding Countersport. And I think this is the, the question of what can we do, and, the, and let me jump on the challenges. Uh, and I'm very uh, frustrated by the challenges of mainstream media. Um, for, for when Paul and I applied for funding for the film, uh, I just wanted to say that there's very little funding uh, for Native American stories. It's very hard to get funding. It's very hard to tell Native American stories. That's one of the great challenges, at least in PBS. You just don't see them. With regard to Countersport, I found out about it through social media. And I was really discouraged. I didn't hear about it in the local news. But I saw all the people that I had met in doing this film, people were talking about it down there. So Caleb and I were talking back and forth, and Caleb and I think Jason was part of that conversation. Well, can we get this in the local media? Well, I have some contacts. Paul and I have some contacts in the local media. They wouldn't touch this story. And part of the problem, I will go out and venture and say, that the people behind this project, one of them is a very prominent businessman, well-loved in Buffalo. And people don't want to make him look bad. And uh, I don't say he controls the media, but they, right? I mean, this was very hard to get in, in, in the news. Very, very hard. And I, 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 we know people in the, in the public radio station, they did do a story eventually, eventually, but this was overlooked. So my biggest frustration, I think one of the biggest challenges as a filmmaker, someone works for PBS, is getting the stories out there. And I don't know how to do that. We did one story. Okay, this was a tremendous success, and this was built on social media. This was not in the traditional media, but I think that's a challenge. And I know uh, Jason and his department, they are geared for doing stories, but I also know that they are tasked with a lot of other things, and it's very difficult to get stories out. I think you raise a, a really great point, and, and maybe everyone can speak to this, around uh, advancements in technology and how that has aided in us being able as native people to share more of our stories whether that be through social media um, or other means if even if we think about getting drone footage and we think about what happened out at Standing Rock so I'm curious um, what we can learn from the Kinzua Dam's uh, case in terms of having to go on a game show to get the story out versus where we are in 2018 and a loved businessman in Buffalo blocks us from all media outlets. So what do, we, what do we do? What are our resources of resistance to get these messages out? And what did you find successful in your experience? Well, I'll just point out, and so we can name names, um, <laughs> <laughs> is that, um, so that, that um, the owner of JKLM Energy is um, named Terry Pagula, and he is the owner of the Buffalo Bills, 
the Buffalo Sabres and everyone's beloved Buffalo Bandits for all you lacrosse fans. So um, this guy's got his, he, you know, he's a billionaire from fracking. And, uh, you know, even eventually some, some of the local media, like right at the final very end, started to come around and, and, and come to the press conference. But um, Channel 2 did nothing to cover it, and it which, which was kind of surprising. They, um, uh, they have a very environmental-themed uh, show on the weekends that's interviewed the Seneca Nation numerous, numerous times, and I know that particular producer was trying to get this story and it was being blocked, blocked, blocked. Um, so, you know, clearly there are powerful interests at play in the mainstream media. Um, I know more about the U.S. context than Canada, to, so I can't speak to that, but you know, there's been conglomerations. They've, they've lifted the laws that allow for monopolies of radio stations, TV stations. Um, so, but at the same time, we've seen this democratization of through um, digital media. You know, in 1998, digital video cameras came out, and instead of having to pay crazy money to go into a studio and um, edit on an Avid system, uh, you, you could do it, you could build a system on your home computer and you could do it yourself. And so I think indigenous people around the world from the Amazon to Australia to wherever um, have, uh, even though there have been um, hesitation and, and caution about certain information, certain teachings and knowledge getting um, out there, that overall, you know, um, the use of media has, has as, as, a, um, as a tool and, and almost as a, as a weapon uh, is, is very prevalent. I mean, particularly look to the, um, the Zapatistas in Chiapas and um, they, they embraced digital media, they embraced the internet when the internet was in a very early form to get their message out and look at um, what happened. You know, worldwide, people knew about them, world people started going there and, and um, supporting them and helping them and, and setting an example that really I would encourage um, anyone anywhere to, to look at what they're doing um, because we have so many challenges in our own communities around democracy. Um, even though, especially for um, Haudenosaunee people, you know, we like to tout around the world the world's oldest democracy and, you know, um, all that. But in, in reality, sometimes we, we don't function all that democratically. And I, I like what the Zapatistas have done um, myself. So, and you can go on the internet and you can download English translations of their textbooks that they use for community education. Yeah, I, I th I'm just going to guess because I learned so much about Standing Rock through social media before the, the mainstream ever showed up. So I have a feeling that that could have been a rather small story if social media really didn't make it bigger and then the main networks pick it up. So I think you're on to something. That's just my belief. Yeah, and I just, I just want to share, share a story about the very first time I was in front of the media with missing and murdered indigenous women's issue. And this was at Canadian Parliament. Um, it's in the House of, in the uh, Parliament building, because the uh, parliamentary media. Um, so standing and doing this presentation in 2004, and uh, there was one camera and one media person sitting in that room. And the camera was the parliamentary camera, right? It goes around and in, internally into parliament. And the, and the, the, the writer that the, uh, was from APTN, they have, they have a, an Aboriginal People's Television Network. Um, so that was in 2004. And in 2000, and what year are we in? <laughs> 18. <laughs> so two years ago, 2016, is when they announced the inquiry of the missing and murdered Indigenous women. 
And so for those, what, 14, 15 years, um, 12 years, I guess it is, there was a major shift in the attention because then there were hundreds of media attention. Um, and how that happened, I think, it was because of the grassroots, um, the grassroots, uh, social media. Um, they were the ones that it just, it just grew really fast. And that was because of community and it was because of the front line and because of um, those that finally paid attention and it was like those who finally paid attention, then it became, it became huge. Um, it's still not at the point where it should be within mainstream because people still don't understand the real reasons why it's happening the way it's happening and why. Um, but I think that still, that has been up, up to us to do that. And just in my experience in dealing with mainstream uh, I've given up uh, thinking that they're going to do anything. I really don't think that they care to do anything because they don't want us to be here and still, we're still in the way. So they're not going to support us. They're not going to support sovereignty. They're not going to support self-determination, both politically and in the courts. Um, and it's pr been proven in Canada um, that they will never support Indigenous sovereignty because the, the judges and the, the way that the court systems have worked is that they've always supported Canadian sovereignty. So if there's anything that's in, in the way, then they will continue to support. Um, and it's law, Canadian law. Can I share a quick story too about social media that, that, that really impressed upon me um, uh, how fast it was it, and just the expansive reach that um, it had gotten was uh, when I got to Standing Rock for the first time in October, uh, maybe four days before the big police assault on the frontline camp um, in the path of the pipeline. Uh, so I had been a, a visiting faculty member for many years at the Emerging Indigenous Leaders Institute, teaching digital storytelling and teaching filmmaking. And so uh, one of my former students has, was, had been at Standing Rock for a long time. I was following all his stuff. And um, you know, I didn't notice just how many people were following this young man till we finally ran into each other in, in all the hustle and bustle on like the second or third day I was there and he snapped a picture with me in the casino and was like, hey, this is the guy that taught me media and, and taught me the power of media. And it got like 600 likes. And I'm like, I'm a pretty good photographer. I, take, I post pictures of the Milky Way and um, it might get like 150 likes, you know, at most. <laughs> and so I was like, Who's, this kid's like a rock star of social media. And then I'm looking at his stats, and he's got like 20,000 people following him, paying attention to what, and, and, and he's, all he's using is a cell phone to sit there and, and give commentary every day on what's taking place. And it was just, um, and there were so many other people doing that. It, it was um, really impressive. And I consider myself kind of in the know of what's going on with media. And well, as we think about media, which is sharing messages, sharing messages of, of water protection, how do we ensure that Haudenosaunee values are, are communicated? How do we chart a path for a future that actually allows for water decision making and for the next proposed fracking facility or hydro development to actually engage us in nation to nation governance for water? Um, how do we make sure that treaties are, are honored and, um, and, and try and, and live uh, some of those, those Haudenosaunee values into practice for, for water governance here, in, here in, in this community. 
um, or in the communities that you're from? I know, not an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just going to uh, start by saying that it's about knowledge um, and understanding about um, Haudenosaunee laws. Um, and when I talk about Haudenosaunee laws, I'm talking about um, when I did when I did my uh, other work is looking at what who who we are as a people. One of the elders had said that Ogwenhwenhya is the word for our way of being, which includes, um, you know, our Thanksgiving address, our uh, great law of peace, um, all of our ceremonies, uh, our songs and our dances, and the wampum and the wampum belts. And those are all sources of Haudenosaunee law. And, um, you know, there's, there's, all kinds of people who have that knowledge in our territories who can share that knowledge. And it's also the language. Like to me that's to me that's also key um, to also understand because that's our connection to the land. And and also understanding the impacts of the losses as a result of colonization and why things are happening the way they are. Um, because there's still a lot, there's still a lot that needs to be taught about why we need to recycle, why we need to protect Mother Earth, you know, why we need to protect the waters and, um, you know, if, I know that it's happening here and, you know, with the, language immersion and with um, the teachings here, even here at Polytech and, um, and at different places uh, in the community and in other Haudenosaunee communities to revitalize that. But it, it also feels sometimes um, that there's a, there's a disconnect to, to the spirituality of it. Um, and the, the connectedness uh, and teaching our young people about that. I have teenage, two teenage grandchildren who are 16 and 14, and even, I mean, they were here to pick up money, right? And I'm asking them to come and, and to listen and to participate. But it's like there's, there's some disconnect there. So it's like, how do we how do we reconnect them even though it's like by I'm thinking it's by osmosis <laughs> that they're gonna learn somehow because I'm doing this that they're gonna they're gonna figure it out but it's like deeper than that and um, and it's trying to trying to make that connection and it I think it's and part of it is also because we're having to deal with other this other colonial system that we're living in these these spaces of this other, even the education system on reserve. Um, you know, it's not our education that we're learning. Um, I don't even know the textbooks in the schools and whether they actually teach Haudenosaunee laws or culture or, you know, what are, what are they learning about sciences you know, and our medicines and, you know, making those connections. Um, so to me, that's what, that's what I would like to see happening more. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul and I can certainly talk about that in terms of communicating with, with non-Indigenous people. Um, we were very fortunate, and please jump in, um, to be not just given the opportunity by a granting agency to go tell a Native American story, to tell a Seneca story, um, and they understood from the beginning that we did not want to tell it from a colonial point of view. We wanted to go find the story and tell the story from the inside out, but that the Seneca Nation allowed us in to tell their story as well. And, 
as you would expect. They, they, there was apprehension at first, because why would two guys from the outside want to go in and tell this story? What's in it for you? What are your motives? Okay. Um, but over the past four years, obviously, we've developed some very good relationships, very great relationships, after, after they saw the film, after they knew that we did a good job in the film, then everything was fine. Um, but um, so I guess what I'm getting to is that allyship. Paul, I, Paul and I have lived in western New York our entire lives. He lives a little closer to the Tuscaroras. I've been visiting the Alleghenies my entire life. And I think the very first time I met a Seneca, I think it could have been Caleb Abrams. And I was in my 40s. And here I lived my entire life. So this was an extraordinary opportunity for me, and now we, we have these relationships, and Paul and I go to remember the removal. Um, so as outsiders, outside the community, you know, I think there is that, yes, it's continuing to build allies, understanding you have to be careful about who's coming in, you know, um, and that's how it gets communicated. Your question was, how do we communicate these values? Well, we're still learning, um, but we're certainly allies of that now because of this opportunity. You want to talk about that? Uh, well, uh, other than that, I agree 100%. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very true. Um, you know, we, we, we understood from the get-go that we were, we were outsiders. And we wanted to tell the story from the inside out, but we also wanted to embed the story within the quote-unquote American narrative, too, of what was taking place in America at that time. So that hopefully, by contextualizing this story, you have a deeper and broader understanding. And <laughs> hopefully, you don't allow those things to happen again. But unfortunately, <laughs> that's, it's not true. But no, we were, we were you know, and, and as Scott said, we were um, welcomed and embraced by the Seneca Nation, and for that, we're, we've always been extremely thankful. And more than that, my, I, I'm not going out on a ledge here to say that we were honored, <laughs> because, and, 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 and quite honestly, I, going back to something I had said very early on in the conversation, when we interviewed Deuce Bowen for the Niagara Falls film, we wanted to understand our connection with nature, our connection with the environment. And you don't get that from the politicians, you don't get that from the, you know, from, from the, the National Forest Service, you don't get that from the parks managers, you get that from the indigenous cultures. And, well, <laughs> Uh, I think that's, I guess, it. <laughs> that, that, that's great. And as we transition into Q&A, because I'm, I'm sure some of you are, are very excited to, to ask questions for our panelists, I, I have one remaining question, and it's looking into the future. Um, in 2007, the United Nations uh, ratified the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which actually states that as Indigenous Peoples, we have individual and collective rights to water. So how can we think about that instrument or envision new legal instruments and mechanisms for articulations of Haudenosaunee water sovereignty for the future? I think the uh, Defending Ohio campaign was one instance of assertion of indigenous sovereignty for water protection. Um, and I hope it, it lays a f strong foundation for a future that sees more articulations of that Haudenosaunee sovereignty. And I'm curious if, if you have ideas of what that might look like or what you hope for in, in a future for your children and your grandchildren. <laughs> yeah, we have a legal eagle. <laughs> Well, I know that the, um, the difficulty with, um, well, especially if you're going to talk about the UNDRIP, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, is that um, it needs to be recognized uh, as 
uh, something that um, can um, be used as a tool uh, to recognize there's all kinds of things in the declaration about sovereignty and about um, you know rights, all kinds of rights and um, being informed. Um, but the difficulty is is that Canada and the U.S. I mean, first they both uh, didn't uh, approve the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, along with. Australia and New Zealand. Um, the difficulty with Canadian law, like I said already, is that they, they will never recognize Indigenous sovereignty, um, no matter how hard we fight for it in those places. Where we need to continue to fight for it is in our own territories, and just we just need to do it. We just need to... Um, to do everything that's been done with, with the, uh, the fracking and we need to stand up, we need to fight, we need to gather. And I think it's inevitable. Um, the things that are coming up um, and what Canada and the US want to continue to do with development, um, that it is, I mean, I think that's a prophecy that it is going to be indigenous people who will con continue to protect lands and territories because that's our job and um, it doesn't matter and should never have mattered what Canadian or American law has ever said um, and that we just continue on with our um, with our laws empowerment of our own laws um, it's been lost you know in many different ways it over generations, you know, from residential school, from education um, systems that we've been forced into, into their, their colonial systems, um, we need to empower and establish and um, revitalize and restore our laws. Um, I think that's inevitable. So in, uh, I believe it was 2011, um, a group of uh, Seneca High School students traveled to the United Nations to give an address, uh, the, the permanent forum on indigenous issues. And I was invited to travel with that group uh, to document their uh, visit to the UN. And this wasn't a, a model UN group that was going to speak. This was an actual group who happened to be students that were there speaking on behalf of the Seneca Nation. Uh, and the students that were there were pointing to UNDRIP as the example and, and citing what happened to our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents with Kinzua as a way of advocating for uh, indigenous peoples in the Amazon that were facing the Belamonte Dam complex at the time. Um, so again, using Kinzua as this sort of uh, touchstone of, of something that was terrible for our people, our community, uh, but using it as a sort of, as a, a rallying point to try to help other indigenous people by asserting these uh, inherent rights that we have as such, uh, it was a really powerful moment to see that. And uh, four years later, my brother actually ended up being one of those students who traveled there to address the UN. And uh, there were t it was about uh, uh, suicide prevention and wellness then, but it, a lot of the same issues were, were coming through in that presentation as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways to engage the youth to really stop and make people pay attention, because it did. Uh, people all day would come and give uh, remarks, and they'd come and go. Maybe someone might snap a photo or something. But when they heard a... Uh, I think a 17-year-old, 16-year-old's voice. I mean, people just started swarming her. She was surrounded, and uh, uh, it, it was amazing, you know, to watch and see that. You know, the 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 notice that the room took at the United Nations. You know, eyes from all over the world were watching. Um, 
But it was just a really powerful example, I think, of seeing that being pushed and, and, and held up as uh, something that needs to be recognized and trying to use our, uh, uh, our trauma and loss as something that could be used to help another community. You know, the, the tricky thing with these, these laws and, and declarations is, um, and not to say that it's not important to advocate for them and for them to be there. I mean, the, the work that's happened at the United Nations has been a direct result, you know, going um, all the way back to 1924 and to Skahe, going to the League of Nations, to um, the 70s and the Confederacy, um, going to Geneva, and, and um, you know, there, there's a line that our people in particular have connection to the, what's been taking place on the international scene, but these colonial powers, they have no integrity and, um, you know, very little morals, because you look at the U.S. and all day long they, they extolled the founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, Madison, George Washington, yet they're completely comfortable, as, as was shown in the movie, with violating an agreement that George Washington signed himself. So they, you know, these things, they, they'll always find ways to break it. Like what the, the Supreme Court in the U.S. said at one point, yes, Oneida Nation, you were, um, you were, were illegally dispossessed of your territory and, and, and it was wrong. And then as they start to buy some of that land back, then all of a sudden it's a problem and they say, no, 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 wait, you, you waited too long to complain about it, so now you can't legally have it and blah, 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 and find some kind of rationale for it. So, um, like Bev was saying, it, it's just important for us to um, do whatever it is that we have to do for our own understanding of, of, of our laws, which for, for, for me is being appreciative for the water. It's all there and, um, you know, the most fundamental form in Ganonyo. And, um, you know, have that attitude of gratitude, like, and appreciate it. And, and that's kind of hard sometimes in the modern world because there's running water everywhere um, and, and people tend to take it for granted. But, you know, I know this community here has had issues for, for many years around groundwater contamination and, and people's wells being bad and such. So when you have those issues, you're more keenly aware of um, just how precious water is. And I think one thing that gives me a lot of hope for, for um, our coming generations for having appreciation for water is that there's um, these rites of passage programs like, um, um, I think it's called um, Oa Logo at um, Akwesasne and it's happening here, um, that having young people go out and, um, and fast in the bush. It's like, if, if you've fasted before from food and water for any number of days, you know, you know the hunger you can deal with um, but the thirst doesn't really go away. Like that water is so important to our bodies being primarily um, comprised of water. We're just big salty bags of water, really. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like, it's those things, those teachings that it's like, if we connect on to it on a personal level, if we remember that we're blessed to live in a, and, and to be from a part of the world where one fifth of the world's fresh water exists here in the Great Lakes, you know, general um, watersheds, the interconnected watersheds, it's like, we, you know, we're so fortunate for that. We're not in a desert where um, they're, they're, you know, it's bone dry, but they, we're facing the fracking and you know, the, um, the cancer alleys of the petrochemical industries. And so I think it's just like, we need to walk our talk too. And, and on a personal level, each of us individually um, appreciate the water and do whatever it is um, that we can to um, show others to appreciate it and, and protect it, you know, like the Black Panther said, by any means necessary. Or I guess that was Malcolm X, right? <laughs>
I, I just I'd like to follow up very, very quickly. Uh, because, I mean, what you say is so, so true. And how we take advantage of the natural world. And it goes back in, our, in the colonial way of thinking when, uh, you know, when, the, when, we, when we first got to this country. <laughs> um, it was always about conquering, conquering people, conquering the lands. And at, at one time, back in the early 1800s, late 1700s, early 1800s, that conquering of the land, that triumph of the land was considered the triumph of art over nature. Those bridges and roads that they were building and the canals they were putting through and building, that was considered art. Art in its highest form. But it was nothing. But it was just a triumph over the uh, over over nature, and we've never lost that way of thinking. We still think in those terms, and that's where the real problem lies, because everything is a triumph over something else, and when it comes to the environment, there is absolutely no no care, no cause, no concern. It's only what we can do to conquer that and what the bottom line is. And, uh, and until we can get past that way of thinking, I'm, I'm afraid very little might change. So I'd like to transition now to, to the audience to a, a question and answer session. Um, if you have questions, we've, I've had the pleasure of being able to ask them quite a bit of questions. So if there are questions from the audience that you would like to ask about the films that you saw earlier or generally um, about uh, land and water and, and our understandings of how we move forward for the future, um, we're open to them. Got one there, yeah. We learned a very important lesson this year in February when the Grand River spilled its banks. Flooding went all up and down the water course. And it went in areas where people had built houses. You know, in those floodplain areas where you didn't have any spirit of pressure to have to build. Well, I think we have to look down at a forward vision down the road to try to protect those banks of the river, to try to protect the habitat of the fish, and not build in those areas which are exposed. So it was a good lesson for us this year with what happened with the flooding that went up and down the grade. And then also I wanted to mention uh, in Newfoundland, they wanted to crack in amongst the uh, world biosphere. Uh, are you aware of that? A few years back, they were going to crack in part of the zoning for the world biosphere. So Newfoundland thought this was fine. It's done a lot of oil and gas. So what happened was the people from the World Biosphere came and they had a chat. And they said, well, what is important to you, Mr. Mayor? It is important to have all these tourists and these people to see the world's great wonder? Or is it important for you to have fracking? So those are my comments if somebody wanted to comment back, especially about the fracking. Well, that, you know, the, so, in, in New York, fracking is, is banned um, by law, and it was a coalition of um, non-native environmentalists as well as um, Senecas, Mohawks, Onondagas, Cuyutas, um, Oneidas, Tuscarora, and other natives from, from other places that live in New York all coming together to stop that. But Pennsylvania has been moving full steam ahead on fracking, and, and the government there has just, you know, given, given everything away to make it easy for um, the companies there. And these are, one of the arguments for stopping it in New York was the areas that they particularly wanted to do, like um, central New York, uh, the Finger Lakes, um, but at one time was was like the heart and the homelands of the Confederacy, uh, is is a big tourist popular area, 
And so that was um, the arguments being made against that, that it's this huge industry and um, why threaten that. And there's also lots of organic farms um, in central New York. But this area in Pennsylvania where the rivers start, that triple divide area, also a big um, tourism area for fishing, um, trout fishing, fly fishing is, um, they, they have some of the cleanest streams in all of Pennsylvania and um, I don't know any numbers on how big the tourist economy is there for it, but the dollars that the fracking industry is flashing around in people's faces um, is, is make, made it so easy now that in just in that one county, Potter County, um, that JKLM Corporation has leased 120,000 acres that they're planning to drill. And, you know, because the, the whole industry is built on speculation and, uh, you know, it's like they, they want us to believe that it's, it's hugely important and there's all this um, money that, that, that's critical to the economy and to energy security and these things that they tout um, in the mainstream media, but the fracking industry is like $800 billion in debt. You know, it hasn't, it, it, it hasn't produced um, anything other than for the fact that it, it's continued more and more speculation because the way that um, the laws are for them to claim how much an area they have leased or that they claim to own, um, the, what they call the um, proven reserves uh, there, and, and then the um, unproven reserves, they, they in, at least in the U.S., they changed the laws of how they define that, so now they can claim that they have even more, so they can get even bigger loans into this, this huge stack of cards in this smoke and mirrors game that's going on. Um, and I think it's important for these things to be pointed out, that, like, you know, the, the solar industry in in U.S. employed more people than the fossil fuel industry last year. That if the government wasn't subsidizing fossil fuels because the Bushes and the Trumps and, and the people like that, the Dick Cheneys that um, run the government are all tied into the oil and gas industry. And so they're making laws to continue to make it easier for them. If there wasn't all this subsidizing of it, you know, it would get blown out of the water by renewable energy. Like um, Mark Ruffalo, the actor, um, you know, Mr. Incredible Hulk and, and rom-com uh, guy, you know, he, he's really cool. You know, he, he was there um, at Standing Rock quite a bit, and, and he's got an organization called The Solutions Project, and they commissioned a study and had an economist look at renewable energy and proved that it would be the, the boom to the economy um, that, uh, you know, the naysayers have been trying to say, oh, no, no, you know, wind and solar, it, it can never do this, it can never do that. It's like, that's BS. People will figure it out. People are, you know, rapidly, if there wasn't all these blocks in the way for it, um, being more accessible and, and available. And, and I think it's important for us um, as Native people to really um, learn about it, embrace it, and, and utilize it, and not just be pawns for the corporate renewable energy. Like I know, too, the community here was, was fighting against some large-scale uh, wind development. I remember hearing in the news some years ago. I don't know what the status of that is now, but that's you know, that's also something we have to be wary about is the corporations are aware of this now and they're trying to lock down the board and have their hands in both places, just like Monsanto is in the GMOs and they're buying up all the organic companies. I think in terms of your, your comment around flooding, it speaks to what you were saying earlier, Paul, that um, we need to reframe the conversation of, of needing to triumph over nature. Um, and I think that that speaks directly to flooding in, in our contemporary understanding that floods are a bad thing. When in a lot of our indigenous epistemologies of, of water and understanding water and our responsibilities to water, floods are not necessarily bad. 
Uh, sometimes they're, they're very much cleansing, they're, they're good, it's, it's nature uh, doing its thing. Um, and, and I think being able to reconstruct the way in which um, we teach engineers, the way in which we think about our built environment, will really carve a path for allowing for more responsible planning when it comes to flood management in the future. Um, and, and so I don't know if any of the panelists have, have things to comment on around floods, but we're going to, with climate change, we're seeing more increased and in extreme climate events, flooding events, um, and, and increased precipitation. So that's not going away, but I think the way in which we manage them can be highly informed by indigenous values, by Haudenosaunee values of, of, of caring and responsibility for water and the rivers. And that's exactly what Arthur Morgan was trying to do in the film was he, he's a systems guy. He's trying to work with the land and with, within, the, within nature's boundaries to, to utilize nature, not use nature, or not change it. And yeah, and it does come down to a, 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 a departure from where our, our heads currently are at in the engineering field and just in society in general. Is there, are there other questions in the audience? I just want to um, just briefly place three sticks in the fire of the dialogue. One is um, just wondering if the Earth Charter, there are legal tools emerging just in recent months that are shown to have incredible influence in courts of law through the Earth Charter, which moves the issue of indigenous laws and rights into the international criminal court in a way that protects the Earth. And I think that's a story. I'm not quite sure why it's not going to end up getting out as fast as possible. But there's, there's some really, really powerful material there that I'm not an expert on. But I think there's a lot of hope in it. Um, the second is um, um, just um, referring to what Jason said a few moments ago. There are a few decades of brain drain about renewable energy resources and innovations that have absolutely exploded from the Grand River watershed. Um, and particularly from the Cambridge, Waterloo, Kitchener area that's now recognized as Canada's Silicon Valley. There could be some powerful stories for you here. And um, the third thing is um, just thinking about what Beverly was saying about these quiet gatherings that are called in the spur of the moment from ordinary people. I think that when we look at the social media, the de-democratization of social media that has been getting wrapped into law, at least in Canada, um, since Standing Rock, we have to always be on our toes as to the ways that our communications through social media are being interrupted and disrupted. And I think somehow there's, there's a connection, a way to use social media to serve the in-person gatherings. Because at the end of the day, change happens when we have small conversations around a kitchen table or around a fire with people we can build trust with. And maybe there are new ways to use digital communications and social medias to strengthen the face-to-face -face relations and the trust, testing, and building that can lead to Thank you. Any thoughts on, on that? Um, I have to say, I, I'll have to look into the new developments regarding the Earth Charter. I hadn't, I hadn't heard about those yet, but I don't know if you had. No, I haven't heard about the Earth Charter either. Hmm. Yeah, I, I do know that, um, I mean, part of maybe looking at law with, um, Bolivia and uh, the President Evo Morales, who is indigenous, did have um, the rights to Mother Earth recognized in law. But then I heard another story that he still supported um, the resource development and oil. And um, so I'm just reading a book about that. And so it's really difficult to trust the, the reality of, of that and what it's actually doing, so, um, and what it does in 
in that kind of legal system. Um, and I, I know that uh, people, people sometimes think that the UN um, is the place to, uh, to bring these issues to. And I know that the permanent form, I've been involved in the, permanent, the UN permanent form for years and, um, and have seen young people, you know, that Cal was talking about that come forward and they present their stories and, and many indigenous people presenting their stories and their traumas and their losses. But it's more than that. I mean, I understand that they, you know, finally having a voice and being able to stand up and being recognized is really important. But it's after that, right? You can keep talking, and this is what I've been doing for years, is talking and talking and talking and talking. And I could just get tired um, because what, where's the action that comes from that? And the UN, I think, is the most colonial place ever because they're all, they're all the state. Um, and that was the fight of the Skaha, was to have uh, indigenous peoples with a seat at, at the world table. And, uh, and he was never given that opportunity. And, and, and you feel that at the UN as an indigenous person and going into the United Nations building and it's the decision makers of of states that are recognized under the UN Charter, which isn't indigenous people. Um, so that's another, a whole other level of, of um, colonialism. Got a hand. I've got a hand. So um, I guess for those of us on, on the U.S. side, for AFN, Assembly of First Nations, so um, if the National Congress of American Indians was helpful at all for the Defending Ohio campaign or um, any of the other regional organizations like UTSET, I, I don't know if uh, Brian Patterson was helpful at all. Yeah, I, actually, um, they were. They Both NCAI and UTSET passed resolutions um, in support of the Seneca Nation stand about the fracking wastewater treatment plant and um, you set did send um, somebody um, with expertise in water law and water issues uh, to come to an intergovernmental meeting that we had and, and provided us with a, um, a wealth of information um, but you know I know the uh, enough about what goes on up here to know the, uh, the challenges for um, AFN and um, I, I I think it's pretty interesting. Um, I, I hope uh, that um, Diabo gets in <laughs> and shakes things up a bit. That, that's about the extent of I know what's going on up here. Yeah. Okay, I've been involved in the politi that political system. Um, I feel that it's, uh, it's a very violent 
place. Um, the, the Assembly of First Nations, the Native Women's Association of Canada, um, all of the other uh, national, what they call the National Indigenous Organizations, it's all, I mean, the, the reason why they were created in the first place was a reaction to the white paper policy in 1969. There was a purpose in their creation um, was to fight for, um, for our rights as Indigenous people. Um, and and it se that seems to have uh, been lost in, in that system because now they feel, I've, I feel that their relationship, and I was involved in that, is the relationship with the federal government. And um, because they're funded by the federal government. And so, um, and so there's a, still a lot of control when you have con contribution agreements that are funded by the federal government and they tell you this is how it's going to be funded and this is what you have to do to follow um, in order to maintain that funding. So when you're under that, you're still under that control uh, of that system. So I really don't believe that any of those organizations have a right to talk about rights or to talk about uh, as Haudenosaunee people um, to have those kinds of conversations with the federal government. Um, it is the, if you want to call it rights holders, um, who have uh, that responsibility. So if we're to go, go to the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, it is up to the Haudenosaunee Confederacy to negotiate with Canada. Um, and, and that has been part of the difficulty because the federal government has only recognized Indian Act governments. Um, so that's the difference between here and, and the United States is the Indian Act and um, what I call the most racist and sexist pieces of legislation that exists in the world. And so, <laughs> to answer your question is, I don't, I, I, I also hope that uh, Russ Daibo is, um, you know, if that system is continuing the way it, it is, that it needs to be shut down because it's not doing what it was originally intended to do. Um, and the resources that are put into those organizations, I can't remember how many millions of dollars AFN has uh, from the federal government. So again, being very, also very cautious when we start talking about money from government is that they really know how to use that to cause uh, divide and conquer within our own people. So we also have to understand that when they throw that pot of money um, out there, that we know that that's what they're trying to do and that they're tr still trying to um, create this divide and conquer within our peoples. And they can be very successful uh, because our people do end up fighting with each other uh, over those resources. And I think we need to step back when that happens and really pay attention to what they're doing and actually having the conversation amongst each other to say that that's what they're doing. We have to, we, we need to be healthy and to have a conversation about, about what they're actually trying to do. I just want to, uh, oh, did you have a Yeah, I want to piggyback off that and, and um, bring it back to um, the, the third stick you added to the fire. Uh, which was about the, the having these dialogues and face-to-face and -face as um, somewhat of an antidote to these divide-and-conquer tactics. Because, like, um, again, to be, um, connect, you know, drawing some lessons from Standing Rock, we saw the use of a, a military mercenary contractor 
to do um, cyber warfare and, and military psychological operations against water protectors and to create a lot of division um, and, and to send physical infiltrators into the camp to um, create div divide and conquer. And so um, it's easy, it becomes easier with social media for things to get um, blown up quickly and people take things personally and they get, they get all um, ruffled up uh, and, and upset about things and, um, and it's like, it, it's just a tool. Sometimes you wanna to say to people, it's like, it's not that serious. It's like a comic book sometimes, just don't take it so serious. But at the same time, we do need to take it serious. Um, one thing that, I mean, so I met a guy um, at, at the camps there at Standing Rock, a Diné guy named Brett Isaac, um, and he built all the solar trailers that were there um, powering things. He had built um, three of them, the one that had been there from the beginning powering um, the PA system at the Sacred Fire, and then um, he brought two more, and, um, and I interviewed him and, and about this, and he said that one of the take-home things was that the young people uh, in the camp were getting to interact at a, on, on a tangible level with renewable energy. They were able to come to the trailer and plug their phone in and see it, um, you know, and, and, and watch as on a sunny day versus a cloudy day, and they could see um, the little windmills that people brought and how windy it is there. Uh, on the planes and, and have a physical interaction with it. And he, and he said in the interview, you know, um, it's kind of like when you come to the camp in person, it's one thing to see it on social media and it's a completely different thing to be there in person and experience the energy and the vibe and, and all that. And so um, I think it's just important that we, we remember that it's, these things are tools and that our people, our species has always used tools and they could be for good or bad from, from the beginning. It's like you can, you can um, nap a piece of flint down and you can um, use that to um, skin your dinner and, and you know, cut up your dinner and feed your family or you could use it to um, kill your neighbor. And it's like in, 2001 A Space Odyssey at the beginning, you know, they've got the, the uh, crow magnons running around and they've got the, um, the bone and it's like it, all of a sudden, oh, it's a club and I can like terrorize the others in my community. So um, I'm thankful that, that we get to have um, a little bit of, of, of an interaction. It's a little weird for me to be with these bright lights and like at least how we can kind of see you guys. I understand as a filmmaker they need, they've got the cameras going and they need to get the light on us. Um, I would suggest a key light so our hair looks a little better, uh, not just the two light system here, but. Well, I want to thank the audience for, for your questions and just transition us to, to closing out for, for this evening. And so to our wonderful panelists, is there anyone that has any additional final remarks that you'd like to share before we close out? I'm just super appreciative to all of you for coming out and, and uh, watching the films and listening to us and for um, Six Nations Polytechnic um, and, and all the staff here for um, putting the, the series together and, and offering this and to the cooks tonight, it was a tasty dinner, Yawa. And I, I follow up on that 100% too, yes, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful venue, I mean I was thrilled when I came in and saw the setup and it's thank you for uh, for hosting this and having us and uh, moderating moderating um it's it's been wonderful and thank you for coming out i appreciate it yahweh well uh thank you to everyone um in in closing i i want to leave you with a quote from uh felix cohen he kind of has a, a troubled history in terms of indian affairs in the u.s but he has a famous quote and he says, like the miner's canary, the Indian marks the shifts from fresh air to poison gas in our political atmosphere. And our treatment of Indians, even more than our treatment of other minorities, reflects the rise and fall of our democratic faith. 
I think our conversations this evening um, and surrounding the story of Kinzua resonate with all of us because we know those stories from our own communities, whether it's the Kinder, Mor Kinder Morgan pipeline or line three or line five or uh, the fracking wastewater that was imminent with uh, Ohio. These are all issues that, that resonate for water protection because we know in all of our epistemologies and our teachings that, that water is life. It is integral to our survival and our cultural existence and, and perpetuity. So I'm thankful to our panelists um, who each have found unique ways to explore Haudenosaunee waterscapes through law, film, public policy, and media. We hope that our conversation today will start a dialogue for water sovereignty that embraces Haudenosaunee epistemologies of caring for water. So Tabutni, Nyawa, thank you to all of you for this evening. Um, it's been really wonderful to have a conversation with you this evening. And to close out in a good way, I don't know, I know it's been a really long evening, but for us is still here, we'll do our, our closing words. Um, and even before that, I just want to give a really big shout out to Stevie Jonathan, who was super integral in making sure that this all got put together so wonderfully. So thank you, Stevie. Thank you.